Thank you, Patty. So now we are going to highlight um, some selected questions and answers in the bulletin. Again, my name is Daniel Parker, and I'm one of the assistant directors on the special education team, along with Patty. Um, and in this section, um, just a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, we are not going to be able to go through all of the uh, bulletin questions, um, but we will. Uh, we have selected a few of them that we will highlight throughout today. And um, with that, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Paula Volpiansky, who helped us in developing this bulletin. Thank you, Daniel and Patty. Um, so I'm Paul Volpiansky, and I have been a consultant with the department for quite a few years. Um, I currently help the special ed team with the development of various learning resources and including this bulletin, as Daniel has mentioned. And before I hand it back to Daniel and some of the presenters, there's just a couple more pieces of background information that I want to share. So let's go on to the next slide, Daniel. Um, so of uh, first thing, a comprehensive evaluation exists within the district's equitable multi-level system of support. And many of you are familiar with that terminology. Um, and if you need more information, there's actually a link at the bottom of the slide where you can go. Um, but anyway, an equitable, equitable MLSS, and I'm gonna use that <laughs> instead of mm -hmm. saying it over again, um, includes um, all educators and all learners and all learning and other school related activities. So achieving educational equity is built on the foundation of an equitable multi-level system of supports. The stronger a school and district's equitable MLSS is, the higher the likelihood that a special education referral will be made when appropriate, and that the easier it will be to conduct a comprehensive special education that accurately and considers and identifies a student's category of disability as well as the student's developmental and educational needs, um, which then can be used to determine what services the student requires. And again, more information is on the link on this slide. You can also reach out to the Wisconsin RTI Center if you want more information about um, equitable MLSS and um, their contact information is also available if you link, go to that link. Next slide, thanks. Um, so the topic of special ed evaluation is full of jargon and technical terminology. And before we continue, we felt it's important to clarify two of the terms that we use a lot, evaluation and assessment. Um, we wanna make a distinction between these two terms special education evaluation, which is a process, and an assessment, which we consider an event. For the purpose of our professional learning today, when you see or hear the term evaluation, we mean a process and set of procedures used to make decisions about whether a child has or continues to have a disability and the nature and extent of the student's educational needs. When you hear or see the term assessment, we mean a specific formal or informal method, strategy, or tool that we use to gather information about an individual student. So assessment is used to gather the necessary and specific data and other information that is then used during the evaluation process to make evaluation decisions. The IEP team uses data from existing or new assessments to support the team's decision about whether a student meets disability category criteria, as well as to identify the needs and whether the student requires specially designed instruction. Um, so, if you've looked at the bulletin, you might wonder where are all, where did all these questions come from? There's a lot of them. Well, they predominantly came from folks like you who have attended learning sessions that the department has put on during which topics of evaluations and IEPs have come up. The list of questions actually began back when we started sharing the college and career ready IEP resources back in 2016. Um, we got a lot of feedback during those times that more guidance was needed to help clarify how the effects of disability and disability related needs could be better identified through the special ed eval process. 
The list was expanded with questions we received during conferences, workshops, stakeholder sessions, um, and other gatherings in which initial drafts of the special education evaluation framework were shared and feedback was requested. And in particular, um, we had a meeting with a diverse stakeholder group of about 50 people who spent the whole day reviewing and providing feedback on our draft special education evaluation framework um, during the summer of 2019. Um, finally, we clarified the questions and worked with the DPI IP support consultants who added some additional questions. And those are the folks who most often answer your questions about special education when you contact the department. So they know what questions you bring to the table. Um, and through last winter and this spring, a small work group worked collaboratively to narrow the bulletin down to those questions which most cl closely related to the IDEA evaluation requirements that Patty talked about a few minutes ago. And yes, we actually had generated well over 100 questions. So 71 is actually narrowed down. Um, and as Daniel mentioned before, we understand that not all the questions you have um, are included in the bulletin, and we won't go even over all the bulletin questions today. Questions that aren't addressed in this bulletin, such as questions that apply to specific disability categories, are being addressed in other guidance documents. We actually saved all of the questions we got and we're um, trying to address them in some place. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Daniel Parker. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, this is Daniel again. Um, and we are now gonna talk about some of the important questions in the bulletin. For sake of time, we're not gonna go through all the questions in the bulletin. This is probably the, this must, this is the largest bulletin we have published at the department. Evaluation is a big topic. We invited staff um, from Wisconsin DPI along with various DPI funded grant programs to, to assist us in identifying questions from the bulletin that they thought should be highlighted in today's presentation. So each presenter will introduce themselves, identify the question they chose, provide a brief explanation of why they felt this question and answer was important to highlight, and provide a brief overview of the answer. Note that the full answer to questions selected are found in the bulletin and also linked on each slide. We encourage you to have the bulletin available on your device in front of you as we go through this section of the presentation. And first, we're gonna begin with general provisions of special education evaluations. So one of my co-presenters was unable to be here today, but they selected uh, question two. So I am gonna go ahead and present on this one. This question asks, what does it mean to conduct a full and individual comprehensive evaluation? So I chose this question because as educators, we often think too narrowly about students and need to take a whole child philosophy. The words full and individual evaluation show up in the Individuals with Disability Education Act, as well as the term significantly, significantly comprehensive when referring to special education evaluations. So this is a long answer in the bulletin, but the answer begins with, by definition, a full and individual evaluation must always be comprehensive. Traditionally, IEP teams have primarily focused on impairment criteria. However, every special education evaluation must be sufficiently comprehensive to also identify all of the, the student's disability-related needs, whether or not commonly linked to the disability categories in which the student has been identified. And that's a direct, that last part is a direct quote from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So the answer goes on to highlight a wealth of important information, clarifying the terms full and individual, as well as significantly comprehensive. It includes highlighting the two-part decision-making for special education eligibility that answers the following two questions. First, does the student meet the criteria for one or more of the disability categories? And second, as a result of the disability, does the student need specially designed instruction? In addition, the answer provides, an important, uh, provides important information about when an evaluation is significantly comprehensive. And the bulletin states that 
the evaluation is sufficiently comprehensive when it provides enough information to allow IEP teams to collectively determine special education eligibility or continuing eligibility and identify the effects of the student's disability and subsequent disability related needs. So in other words, the evaluation must yield enough information to allow the team to move forward to develop a review to develop or review and revise the student's IEP if the student is found eligible for special education. This means the team must have the information needed to make decisions about how to educate the student so the student can access instruction and make progress towards meeting the expectations and standards that apply to all students of the same age or grade. There's a lot in this question. It goes on to talk about key requirements of comprehensive evaluation, including important information about review of existing data, using technically sound assessment tools and strategies, not based decision making on a single assessment, and ensuring assessments and other evaluation, evaluation methods used during the evaluation are selected and administered to be non-discriminatory, free of bias, and racially and culturally sensitive. Hi, my name is Carlyn Higby, and I am also one of the educational consultants on the special ed team. And I chose question five, what is meant by the requirement to conduct an evaluation that, quote, assists and in determining the content of the student's IEP. I chose this question because as an OT and a member of numerous IEP teams, um, this always seems to be uh, an important part of um, how we look at who is contributing to that information and how we can conduct it and offer information for the team from everyone's specialized lens. You can go ahead and advance, Daniel. So the overall answer to the question is that and it ties in with what Daniel was just saying, the evaluation in part identifies the effects of the student's disability and disability related needs that should be addressed in the student's IEP, irrespective of the student's disability category. So that goes on to highlight the importance that each team member brings information about how the student is functioning in all areas of their school performance. If you look back at the MLSSS diagram, you'll see the importance of looking at that complete whole child and all of the ways that they are functioning in the school setting. And to look at what are the things that are the barriers um, to their ability to access and engage in their education. Um, question six asks, what is the difference between a disability related need and a disability category or impairment? Um, this question was chosen because in the past we have received calls at DPI asking if the IEP needs to provide sensory, academic, or social and emotional supports to students if those academic or functional skills areas were not listed in the disability category for which the student was identified. In addition, we received questions about addressing needs of students for quote unquote speech only students and separating out the difference between disability and disability related need may also come up with other disability categories. It's one we get a lot. And so the answer to this question starts with saying an impairment is a specific category of disability named in state and federal law. To be eligible to receive special education services, a student must be found to meet criteria for at least one disability category and by reason thereof need specially designed instruction. It goes on to talk about how a disability related need is related to the effects of the student's disability on the student's academic and functional performance compared to age or grade level standards and expectations and a disability related need is best stated as an academic or functional skill that the student needs to improve or increase to meet age or grade level standards or expectations. Information from the evaluation about the effects of the student's disability and resulting disability related needs related to access, engagement, and progress in age or grade level general education curriculum is used to develop the IEP. Thus, IEP teams are encouraged to ensure a special education evaluation is able to identify all of the student's potential disability related needs. Hi, everybody. My name is Jenny Bibler. I'm the early childhood special education consultant on the Wisconsin special education team. Question seven asks, for an initial evaluation, does the team need to only evaluate areas addressed in the written referral? 
I chose this question because there is a question that we get at DPI frequently after the fact. This question commonly is asked after the initial evaluation and after the IEP has been implemented. For example, a referral is made for a special education evaluation because the student has a possible speech delay or the student is unintelligible or in the case of a young child, the referral may come in as a student is not talking yet. The team then evaluates the student and determines the student is eligible for special education by meeting the criteria for a speech language impairment and receives special education services. After working with the student, the speech language pathologist now comes back to the IEP team and says that there may be more going on with this student in terms of social and emotional needs and academic needs such as reading after they've been working with them on specific speech language services. What should we do? And the answer is the answer that the answer to this question begins by stating no. The purpose of the referral for an initial special education evaluation is to inform the LEA that the individual submitting the referral suspects the student is a child with a disability and as a result needs special education services. This answer goes on to highlight that the referral itself is only the starting place of the comprehensive special education evaluation process. As part of the process, the review of existing data considers information collected from the referral, including other multiple sources. The data informs the IEP team of potential developmental, academic, and functional needs, as well as the disability categories. My name is Stacy Heckendorf, and I am the engagement coordinator and the educational audiology consultant for outreach services for the deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. And question nine asks, can an IEP team determine eligibility under section 504 that is concurrent with an initial special education evaluation or re-evaluation? I chose this question because particularly in the area of deaf and hard of hearing, um, some districts often want to bypass the special education evaluation and go right to 504. And I always ask them, how do they know that there are no educational needs if they have not evaluated the student? It's better to err on the side of caution and do the evaluation and rule out the need for specially designed instruction rather than not do the evaluation and be found out of compliance later. Nationally, in the area of deaf and hard of hearing, we have seen some states use the same evaluation process in determining eligibility under Section 504 and IDEA. Next slide, please. Oops, trying to get mine to switch here too. Um, so the answer to this question um, begins with stating yes, LEAs may use the same evaluation process in determining eligibility under Section 504 and IDEA. The answer goes on to highlight that there is nothing in federal or state regulations that prohibit an LEA from concurrently considering eligibility during the same evaluation meeting. LEA, LEAs are encouraged to document IDEA and Section 504 decisions separately and Section 504 does not entitle a student to the same services as IDEA. For more information, you're encouraged to review the full answer in the Bulletin 21.01. Now we are going to look at the section on general obligations related to conducting special education evaluations. Uh, before we go on to this section, um, Patty, is there anything you would like to add on any of the questions in the previous section? You know, I don't. I um, I think that these are such important questions, and some of the um, information that's being highlighted, I think, is reflective of this bulletin, which is really. Um, and and I just want to, um, you know, particularly um, highlight or give a shout out to Paula and Anita Castro for, for their work on this bulletin, as well as everybody um, that, that, that 
put their thoughts together. But it's such it's a bulletin that gives such comprehensive information um, and and really thinks deeply and critically about the purpose of evaluation. So I don't have anything other to, else to add, just that, um, you know, I, th I think that this bulletin is just a great source of information.